Welcome to this panel of the Delphi Economic Forum 2020. My name is Kevin Featherstone and I'm a professor at the London School of Economics. Our focus is the future of multilateralism in the world economy after the COVID-19 pandemic. We are all sharing a global economic crisis. Some see the fallout as a retreat from globalization. In truth, we were already scheduled to discuss the future of multilateralism in the world economy, even before the COVID pandemic took hold. Against the background of uh, increasing trade disputes, attacks on the World Trade Organization, and a new economic populism, the topic was already uh, us. Of course, the spread of COVID-19 has enlarged many of these uh, challenges. Almost everywhere, we see the role of the state in domestic markets increasing, with new forms of protectionism, uh, wider uh, public ownership, and governments internationally seem to be sidelining established international organizations. Last week, over 200 current and former world leaders called for the G20 summit scheduled for this November to be brought forward. Former British Prime Minister Gordon Brown, a signatory to this letter, Prime Minister at the time of the 2008 financial crisis, said it would be an abdication of responsibility by the G20 if it was not to act decisively at this time. And he highlighted the threat to the world's poor, indeed uh, saying that it would be devastating to the world's poor if the G20 did not take hold of the situation. So the background to our discussion is very clear. We have forecasts of falls in international trade, a major loss of GDP around the world, governments moving to greater protectionism, economic activity moving away from the global networks that had become so familiar, global institutions being sidelined, and seemingly an absence of international leadership. So where are we heading and what can be done? To guide us through these complex and interconnected themes, we have an expert panel. Let me introduce them in the order that they will be speaking to us. Randall Henning is Professor of International Economy at the American University in Washington, DC. He has written extensively on international trade and indeed on the European Union. He has testified before Congress on these matters. Linda Yu is a colleague of mine at the London School of Economics, where she's a visiting professor in LSE Ideas. She also holds positions at the London Business School and at Oxford University. She's a well-known broadcaster and writer. Jean Pisani Ferry is currently a professor at the European University Institute in Florence with uh, a similar position at the Hertie School of Governance in Berlin. He's had extensive public policy experience, uh, both in Brussels and Paris at very senior levels. Each of our guests will speak for approximately five, seven minutes to get the debate started, and then we'll have a general group uh, discussion. So can I please invite Randall to uh, start the proceedings? Randall. Thank you very much, Kevin. I uh, appreciate your bringing us together in this way, and I thank the uh, Delphi Economic Forum uh, for uh, organizing uh, this conference. Uh, I hope that we'll be able to meet in person in Delphi at some point in the not too distant future. Uh, it makes some sense that we should begin with the United States uh, and uh, in this uh, triad, uh, because uh, Trump is, of course, one of the primary reasons to be concerned about the future of uh, multilateralism. Uh, this uh, president has pulled the United States out of or threatened to pull the United States out of or halted the funding uh, to at least uh, 15 international organizations and major agreements. 
So in uh, what direction is the global system of multilateralism moving? Uh, and kind of what impact do we see uh, from the pandemic for the outlook? So my general answer is A, that COVID-19 accentuates kind of both the forces for and against multilateralism. Um, as far as I can tell, I don't think it has a bias, but it certainly raises the stakes uh, for uh, cooperation. And, and B, I'd say the U.S. posture toward multilateralism depends greatly, maybe almost entirely, right, on the outcome of the November election. We could be having a very different conversation about this uh, in six months uh, than we're having now. So the, uh, I have three or four, depending on uh, the time, a couple points of uh, context and elaboration. So first, I'd like to say global uh, multilateral institutions, right, have been under stress for quite some time, right, from competition from new organizations, such as preferential trade agreements or regional financial arrangements, uh, so that international cooperation in various issue areas uh, has been underpinned not just by a single global lateral institution, but rather by clusters of institutions, which many of us would refer to as regime complexes. Right? And these complexes offer the hope that cooperation might be resilient in the face of pop populist nationalism because some modes of cooperation could take over from the institutions that are eviscerated or attacked by uh, nationalist governments. Trump's attack on the core institutions of each cluster, say the WTO in trade, the World Health Organization in health, even questioning NATO, right, puts this hope uh, for resiliency uh, to the test. The second uh, point that I would make uh, is that uh, Trump's uh, attack on multilateralism differs across the issue areas. Right? The World Bank and the International Monetary Fund have, uh, for the most part, avoided the worst. Uh, for those institutions that have been in Trump's sights, uh, China seems to be a primary motivating factor. Right? In the WTO, the administration has crippled dispute settlement by dismantling the appellate body. Uh, we can expect uh, this dismantling to be a prelude to new trade conflicts that the administration might wish to launch. COVID-19 kind of creates, of course, right, a compelling case, a compelling functional case for cooperation in, on trade in medical equipment, uh, on intellectual property, and in vaccine uh, development. But it wouldn't be realistic for us to expect uh, the administration to take a cooperative approach in these areas. It, instead, it, it sees kind of greater gains kind of to vaccine nationalism, for example. But, right, and this is my third point, uh, the election can change U.S. policy quite dramatically. Right? It may be true right, that Democrats do share some of the grievances toward China some of the same grievances toward China as Republicans and Trump. But make no mistake about it, uh, these two approaches are kind of fundamentally different. Right? The present Republican Party exhibits a strong sovereignty jealousy. Democrats are far more open ideologically to institutionalized uh, cooperation internationally. In fact, I go as far as to say that the Democratic agenda will need international cooperation to achieve many of the economic and financial goals within it. Climate change, digital regulation, financial stabilization, global economic recovery, immigration, right? These will require support uh, for uh, the multilateral institutions, right? Uh, Democrats, uh, will confront China on many of the same issues the Republicans do, right? And we could add human rights in Hong Kong to that list. Uh, but they will seek to engage China directly 
right, in order to make the red lines clear and avoid miscalculation that could lead to crises. And uh, they're likely to pursue a coalitional strategy vis-a-vis -vis China, right, in which institutions and agreements like transatlantic, uh, trans-Pacific partnership um, uh, had been, right, these agreements will be integral to the strategy. So the, the final observation I'd make uh, is that the progressives, right, on the left side of the Democratic Party are going to have to come to terms uh, with international institutions, which some of them have uh, criticized in the past. Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren have been criti critical of the International Monetary Fund, the WTO. Much depends on their recognizing and accepting of the transformations that, for example, the Bretton Woods institutions have undergone in the last several years in terms of the climate change agenda, the environmental anti-corruption, and the social justice agendas. Uh, today, uh, these institutions have changed greatly, right? We're not, we're no longer working with uh, our grandmother's uh, international monetary fund. And a, a change uh, in the U.S., uh, you know, in U.S. politics uh, could bring uh, could bring the United States policy much closer to uh, the European Union and Europe, European preferences on these. So expect an outreach uh, f uh, to Europe kind of from a uh, from a Biden administration if we have a Biden administration. I have a couple of other comments related to the G20 and the G7, but I'm going to defer to my my co-panelists, uh, uh, and we'll save those who are uh, for later on in our discussion if we have. Time. Thank you. Thanks, Randall, very much indeed. We'll uh, no doubt pick up those uh, remaining themes in the discussion later. Linda. Thank you very much, Kevin. And thank you to the organizers of the Delphi Economic Forum. Um, it's lovely to see how quickly we've been able to move online. But of course, I think we all hope we will be in beautiful Greece um, before too long. So I think I'm going to focus my comments a bit on more on the economic institutions and perhaps a bit on the competition between the United States and China, which I think will become well already is in many ways a defining feature of the multilateral system. And it is something that I think has been accelerated um, by COVID-19. Uh, um, we've seen, of course, the the backlash against um, China um, and the information around the outbreak in Wuhan, the WHO under pressure. I think all of that is adding to a backdrop where the multilateral system itself was already feeling the strain of having um, a second economic superpower, China, um, that um, began to rival the United States um, in a number of areas. Um, for instance, um, China becoming the world's biggest trader, um, China becoming the world's biggest manufacturer. I think all of these things are suggesting a what some have described as an era of great powers. Um, I'm an economist. I'm going to stick to um, more the institutional side and the economic um, relationships. But I think this backdrop is important because one of the things that um, I see as as a defining issue in the coming years for the multilateral system with implications for the international economy um, is whether or not we have a balkanization of the global system. So um, what do I mean by this? Well, I think we've already um, over the past few years before this pandemic have already seen that um, China would like to have more representation um, on the international financial institutions. So um, the IMF, the World Bank, um, and this has been going on for a number of years. China has also set up its own supranational institutions. For instance, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank um, is one. And I think this um, these institutions no longer have um, the, for instance, the AIIB, um, you know, sits apart um, from the multilateral um, institutions, um, uh, the the Bretton Woods institutions, and so all of that would be very familiar uh, to many um, who have been observing this. But I think what we currently now face um, is a 
an acceleration, I think, of this tension. So, for instance, um, we are now in the 21st century global economy where a lot of um, there's a lot of um, uh, gaps in terms of um, technology standards, if we can use that as an example. Um, so, for instance, who sets the standard for things like 5G? Um, who sets the standard for uh, data? Um, and this is an area where the current multilateral system, for instance, the WTO, uh, has launched a new round last year, which is geared at trying to have a greater degree of liberalization, opening up agreement of norms and standards around the digital economy, global economy, um, launching it as a sort of pluralistic effort of a number of countries to see whether or not global standards can be agreed. And to me, this is an area where the tension we see between the US and China and the global system will come to the forefront. So in other words, you know, who um, who will be setting these standards? And as we know, um, standards are different um, in these areas for different countries. There's a very gross generalization that I've been um, given before, which I'll repeat, and I realize it is a generalization, a simplification, is that in the area of data, um, in China, the state owns your data. Um, in the United States, companies own your data. And in uh, Europe, um, the EU, um, you own your data. So I'm using this just as an illustration of where I think a lot of the tensions in the global economic system will be in the future, which is around norms, standards, um, the kinds of things that govern digital and services trade. And this does require global um, cooperation to come to some degree of harmonization of norms, um, if not rules and regulations. And that is, I think, um, going to be uh, challenging, <laughs> as we already heard Randall describe. There, you know, the entire multilateral cooperative system, I think, is under strain. Um, but I'm sure we'll touch on a lot more of these. But I just want to conclude by saying that I think quite a lot of this strain, the multilateral system, we've seen this in history. Um, it does happen when you have a shift in economic um, weight, where economic drivers of growth are coming from. Um, but, you know, like Mark Twain said, history doesn't repeat itself, but it often rhymes. <laughs> Um, so we have been here before, but it's also quite new in many ways. Um, the uh, what China's um, rise is going to mean for multilateral cooperation, I think, is going to be um, there's going to be quite a lot of frictions um, in the coming years as we uh, navigate this. And I suppose the final thing to comment on is just. You know, as an economist, I'm always very keen on institutions and rules and <laughs> norms and and all of, and behavior. Um, but I recognize this a lot of this is about power and struggles over power are not always uh, very straightforward to resolve. And I think the the ten a lot of the tensions of the multilateral system today, um, you know, at least some of it has to do with shifting power. Thank you, Linda, very much indeed. Uh, last but not least, Jean. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. It's good to be to be back in Delphi. Um, it's a fundamental debate we're having, and we we have here two different views. One by Randy, who says it's mostly the Trump administration, um, and the, the the different administration would come back to multilateralism and would have a very different attitude and we could in a way resume. And Linda is saying, no, it's more structured than that. It's more about power. Um, and the rivalry between China and the US is going to dominate the discussion on, on this issue. I'm closer to Linda, definitely, although I obviously don't, and I, I don't think anybody um, uh, neglects uh, the particular stance of the Trump administration, but I think it's more structural. And I think um, what's happening with the COVID-19 uh, crisis is, is really bad news. Because part of the discussion we're having on uh, global governance is about whether we need it really. 
whether it is really something that requires having a level of decision that above the nation state. And, you know, as economists we would say, the, 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 the case where the, there is no debate is the case of the, of the global public good. So when there is something that by nature, by definition, uh, is having an effect across borders um, and that can only be tackled by, by collective action. Um, climate is a perfect example of a, of a global public good, but, but health, public health also, because pandemic travel, because research um, into vaccines will benefit uh, everyone. Uh, it's not by accident, actually, that uh, international coordination, this was studied by Richard Cooper in an article uh, back, I think, in the, the late 70s, where um, he started studying the, uh, the history of cooperation in public health because he wanted to understand what are the obstacles to, um, to international cooperation in the economic field. And actually, it did start in the, in, in, in the 19th century with the fight against a pandemic that was cholera at the time. So the fact that we have been uh, rather unable to cooperate, and here I'm not speaking only of the uh, relationship between China and the US, but, but more, more generally, I mean, the, the, the whole of the international cooperation in this crisis is, is very much elementary. Uh, scientists do their, 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 their job. I mean, they, are, you know, they, they make progress, they exchange uh, papers. Uh, um, uh, every, everything is uh, available on, uh, in real time. Uh, but that's not uh, true for, for policy. And, and this is, um, this is worry. Now, Gordon Brown, you said, um, uh, said recently that the G20 should not abdicate. I think the G20 abdicated uh, some years ago. The G20 had a good start, um, but then very quickly it became less and less relevant, less and less effective. And I think I wouldn't put uh, much hope in, uh, in the G20. So what, what are the issues we are uh, facing? And that goes back to the discussion between, between Linda and, um, and Randy. I think there is clearly this issue of power, of rivalry between China and the US. Um, but if it were only a question of power, we know how to negotiate uh, about uh, relative weight, relative powers. Um, you know, we know that China is underrepresented in the Bretton Woods institutions. And so giving more weight to China as well as to other emerging countries would be painful for the, the incumbent uh, powers, uh, but would be a sort of straightforward thing to do. Uh, what's more difficult is that there are different concepts of what international cooperation is about. There are different concepts of international relations. There are different views on what they should be the content of, of global rules. And I think this is a much more difficult uh, issue to, to, to tackle. Um, with the example that Linda gave about uh, data and about you know, the, the fundamental question of who owns the data is a very good illustration of, um, uh, of this issue. Uh, and the same applies to you know, many different fields. Second, we have um, an issue of um, uh, multipolarity. Um, we're not speaking only of China and the US. We're speaking of a very uh, different world in which the uh, economic power and demographic power and military power are much more distributed than they were before. If you take any indication of the weight of the different power in, in the global uh, economy and the you know, global world, uh, you see that um, we're coming to a situation that's relatively without precedent uh, when uh, there's much more distribution among the number of, of major poles of, of power. And that's particularly difficult to organize because one of the key questions with international cooperation is who is providing the entrance of last resort? I mean, who is going to, that goes back to Kindleberg as an analysis of the Korean Depression. Who is going to be providing the, the, the market of last resort? Who is going to be uh, providing the finance of last resort? And this is very difficult to share among uh, a subset of, of powers. This is much easier if a particular country uh, has a, this role and considers that it is 
part of the contract that it fulfills uh, these roles and derives actually some benefit from it. Finally, I would uh, mention also the fact that we have institutions that are dedicated to trade, uh, to uh, international finance, to regulation, but we are facing a host of new questions. And those new questions um, cannot um, rely, well, for addressing these new questions, we cannot rely on the same institutions. We have a very weak institutional structure for, for climate, for data, for migration, for standards. We don't have strong international institutions. So institutions are a sort of social capital for globalization. And, uh, you know, I'm always, when whenever something um, is sort of assigned to the IMF, I'm sort of confident that the IMF has the resources, has the expertise to not necessarily to solve the problem, but to make progress. When I'm speaking of these other fields, I'm much less confident because there is much less in common uh, to start with. And that's a difficulty. Thank you, Jean, very much indeed. Uh, I guess if we start with a focus on uh, trade, we we have a, f a focus of how to en enhance the uh, provision of global public goods. And the task is how we converge in our conceptualizations of uh, the rules for economic uh, exchanges. Uh, Jean was uh, essentially saying the WTO uh, is uh, sidelined, the G20 is past its sell-by date. Uh, if I could start with Randall, uh, you were giving a more optimistic uh, interpretation of the Biden uh, presidency, but I suppose uh, there's two questions for you in response to what has just been said. One is, uh, unless Biden wins by a landslide, which I'm not sure many commentators are expecting, then he would likely face not only a fractious Democratic Party, but a potentially difficult uh, Congress. So Biden might have an inclination to be more multilateral and more positive to international cooperation, but he could be hamstrung uh, by what's happening on the hill, as they say. And so I wonder uh, what difference uh, a Biden presidency might be able to make uh, in practice. But the second point, Randall, is uh, do you think a, a Biden presidency would seek to resuscitate the World Trade Organization or would it have a bolder agenda of trying to suggest some new kind of architecture? So, uh, so yes, thanks for those questions. I, uh, let me, let me say, let me answer that in the context of two larger points. So I do believe that the uh, rivalry between the United States and China is, is now a structural feature of the global economy, right? And, and so the, so the change that I see uh, with a democratic administration in the United States, if we have one, uh, is not that the rivalry goes away or that the rivalry is not pursued on the U.S. side, but that the institutional form, right, uh, in which this takes place is going to be is going to be different, right? So, first of all, I would expect a democratic administration not to antagonize. Uh, kind of Chinese policymakers unnecessarily. Um, I expect them to engage in dialogue in a way at multiple levels in ways that the Trump administration is not. And I expect that uh, the a Biden administration, if there is one, uh, to pursue um, uh, to support institutions as part of its strategy. Okay, to cooperate with China where that's possible, and to confront China uh, where uh, the United States has as partners. Uh, in doing so on each of those issues uh, that uh, Jean uh, and Linda have eliminated, data, uh, digital governance, uh, climate change, environment, and so forth. So, so I, the, I, with respect to the WTO in particular, 
Yes, I do believe that the Biden administration would see the WTO as core to its strategy uh, to maintain open trade and revive the global economy after the pandemic. Uh, but um, they would, uh, I would expect, a U.S. effort to uh, to to reform and adjust the the uh, the international trade regime uh, in ways uh, that do allow it to address these new issues uh, that that we see. So, for example, uh, in in climate, right? I think we need to have you know a WTO reforms that address uh, trade in carbon emission emission credits. Personally, I would like to see a WTO that's friendly to border adjustment measures. Uh, when the EU, for example, uh, wants to put on uh, border adjustment measures to equalize uh, carbon taxes, uh, and uh, and I think uh, we would expect a democratic uh, kind of push uh, to make the trade regime relevant, more relevant to uh, a, a progressive agenda on digital governance, data privacy. Uh, and um, uh, monopoly, anti-monopoly action and competition policy uh, action against uh, the huge uh, kind of mega data uh, data companies, right? Uh, digital, uh, you know, uh, digital companies um, that are gobbling up larger and larger parts of that sector. So uh, that's my, okay. That would be how I'd respond. Thanks very much. Uh, Linda, you used a great term, the threat of the balkanization of the international uh, economic system. I wonder, uh, from the perspective of China, uh, whether the Beijing um, leaders would see the future in the same uh, binary uh, divide that Randall has indicated, that uh, whether they would respond uh, to a very different, uh, whether they would expect to see a very different approach from Biden and what kind of response China might give to that different approach. It's a great question and it'd be a brave person to, I think, um, uh, try and, uh, uh, I suppose, uh, assess what, um, Beijing is thinking. <laughs> so I'm going to take a slightly different approach, which is I think the balkanization issue has been with us already very quietly for some time because the US-China trade war has already um, meant that companies had to think hard about whether supply chains could encompass both the United States and China. And of course, that relates to um, investment and foreign direct investment and all of those um, things. So the balkanization I describe um, has already sort of emerged where companies and countries have to think hard about whether or not they're going to risk those kinds of frictions um, given the tensions that have been going on now um, for um, some time between the US and China. Um, it's only heightened um, with the trade war, but I would stress that it has been there uh, for uh, pre uh, the Trump presidency. So for instance, President Obama's Asia pivot um, was once described as a pincer movement um, in terms of setting up a relationship with, uh, with Asia, actually not including China in that trade agreement, the TPP that um, was being devised at the time and TTIP, which was this free trade agreement with the European Union. So sort of a, um, uh, pincer, I guess, in terms of world trade, but I said, but I suppose the kind of the bigger uh, kind of stepping back and picking up some of the points um, that both um, Randall and John have, um, you know, have mentioned. I think we are now entering um, a period in which there are gaps in terms of um, what the global economic system already covers um, and what to do about governing those gaps. So we all know. Um, that, um, for instance, the services part, GATS, of the World Trade Organization doesn't have as much teeth as the manufactured parts. And the, the gaps that are opening up around data, around uh, global public goods, which clearly includes climate, all of those need to have global cooperation and at least global norms, if not an actual institution which sets um, something stronger, like rules. 
So to me, that's really where the conflicts between um, different standards, different regulations um, are likely to come to the forefront. And if it's not resolved, then because there's such a need to cooperate across borders when it comes to global public goods, you could also end up with a form of balkanization where maybe regions follow um, their own standards and their closest trading partners in their regions sort of adopt similar standards on emissions or um, health. And that's another um, way in which the world system could balkanize. And I think I would find that particularly worrying. So I suppose I would urge everyone to think hard about what kind of, um, if not institutions, then maybe platforms or secretariats um, could host consensus building discussions around sharing technology for uh, for instance, on health, and that could may well be the, the WHO, which is currently doing that with COVID. On climate, it's a bit more challenging, obviously, because, um, you know, quite a lot of the institutions that need to be there are not there. So where should it sit? If not the G20, okay. the G7, is there another body? So I think to me, those are the kind of big defining issues um, we need to think about. Okay. Thanks very much. I'm conscious that we're going to run out of time. I wondered, uh, Jean, if you could... Uh, perhaps respond to the point that what if we don't fill the gaps in international governance? What if those uh, forces for balkanization continue? I wonder what the scope is for the European Union to better promote its own interests. Some writers have talked about the European Union having a much greater potential to use its trading power, leverage, uh, Robert Kahane has talked about um, sharp power, which the European Union could uh, utilize. In the areas of data and uh, digital technology that you referred to, um, some have suggested that uh, Europe might be able to develop its own data rating agency and forms of its own, uh, setting its own standards. So I wonder just briefly, what scope do you think there is for the EU to be a rather more proactive than reactive player? I have no doubt that the EU uh, feels much better in a, in a world of rules, um, in a world of multilateral negotiations, than in a world where power uh, dominates. Uh, that's because it's itself built on rules and it's itself built on the notion that power is not that uh, what should uh, uh, determine international relations, especially international economic relations. That being said, I think even before this crisis, there was a growing consciousness that the EU should rethink part of its, uh, its agenda, part of its uh, worldview, um, and, uh, and, and grow up to a, a different world uh, where, where power matters more. Um, the notion of sovereignty, for example, was already present um, in the agenda of the Commission. It's been strengthened by the, the COVID crisis. Um, the big question will be then um, how to combine the uh, aim for, for sovereignty uh, with the rejection of protectionism. Um, there is a very simple way of thinking about sovereignty, which means, you know, I want to rely on myself and exclusively on myself to produce anything that uh, I may need. Uh, there is a more subtle way of doing it, which is to, I have to make sure that in terms of the critical technologies, in terms of access, um, in terms of uh, being able to um, survive uh, more aggressive behavior by one of the partners and the US sanctions against Iran were a wake up call in this regard. Um, I should be able to, to you know, uh, very briefly find a way to, to, to behave, to manage uh, this type of situation. And I think that's uh, what the EU is coming to. Okay, I think we are now out of time, but thank you to each of the panelists and we look forward to reconvening in Delphi in person next year. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much.